It's the Daily Dog. Hello, friends. Welcome in. I am excited to be welcoming Richard Henshaw of the band Haken into the Daily Dog for an interview and conversation. Richard, welcome. How are you? I'm very good. Very, very happy to be here. So thank you it's, for inviting me. You're welcome. It's hap- it's it's great to have you here. Uh, I, uh, you know, I've been doing these reaction videos for a couple of years now, and it was maybe a year or so into it um, when uh, I, I started getting some people going. You need to look at this uh, band. They're called Hawken, and mm-hmm. and I'm and so I go. I, I had to figure out how to pronounce it first, uh, and so they know. But I've always been told it's 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 like bacon. If if you know bacon, then you know Haken. And and yeah. y'all have been one of my favorite finds. I did not know of the band uh, before I started doing my reaction videos, and I now have uh, uh, several of your, uh, or at least a few of your uh, uh, LPs. I've got The Mountain on LP, and I've got Affinity, and so I'm, I'm, uh, I need to get some more, but uh, that's what I have for now. So uh, as y'all are, uh, are getting ready to, to go on your new tour, I wanted to go back to the beginning a little bit uh, with your bio i was reading that uh, you took uh, piano lessons as as a kid and that your mom was a piano teacher did you study from your mom or from somebody else well i was very lucky because i grew up in a musical household my mom was a piano teacher as you mentioned hmm. uh, so i would always wake up at the weekends and she would be teaching people downstairs you know the likes of bach and chopin and all of that stuff. So I would wake up to the sounds of that. And it really, mm. really inspired me and got those kind of musical cogs turning in my head. And maybe it was one of the catalysts that really got me to be a writer and a musician in the first place. And then the flip side of that was that my dad was a big music lover. And he he loved the bands like Gentle Giant. Sure. And had, a, yeah, he had an obsession with Pink Floyd. So that definitely rubbed off on me as well. Hmm. So I had both of those influences um, that really inspired me to kind of pick up the piano and pick up the guitar and you know, be a musician for myself. When uh, you yeah. when you uh, heard Gentle Giant, uh, what did you think of them? Or, or did, did you like them as much as your dad? Well, it blew me away. I mean, what I love about Gentle Giant is their very clever use of syncopation it's i feel like every instrument has its part mm-hmm. in the arrangement so if you listen to each part individually it might not necessarily be that complicated and that tricky to play but when you listen to all of those elements together it creates this rich tapestry of sound which is gentle giant and that's definitely something we've tried to take on board in haken you know yeah. we, really, we really think about the arrangement and we need to make sure that you know, when we're not filling or stepping on someone's toes and we're trying to fill in the right gaps just to create that nice sounding rug of sound. And for sure, bands like Gentle Giant and King Crimson, you know, they, they're masters of that. And we definitely take a lot from them. I, I have done some Gentle Giant on my channel. I've also taken a look at some of their tunes on my Patreon. Uh, recently, I did. I took a look at The House, The Street, The Room from one of their early albums. I took a look at Knots. Uh, and you know, when I remember the first song that I ever heard from Haken was Cockroach King. And yeah. it was not too long before then that I had heard Freehand, all of Freehand by General Giant. I'm like, there's some syncopation and there's some there's some rhythmic stuff that's sort of been passed down from generation to generation there. A hundred percent. I mean, I'm yeah. not even gonna lie about it. Like we wear our influences on our sleeve, you know? Mm-hmm. And Gentle Giant, especially around that time of writing the mountain, because you know, I was listening to a lot of that stuff. And another aspect of Gentle Giant that I really latched onto when I was listening to it was the a cappella stuff. It's just incredible that the arrangements just blew me away. And Cockroach King is definitely tipping the hat to Gentle Giant hundred percent. But it's also got other elements like more modern metal sounds in there like the likes of Meshuggah sure. in some of those weird instrumental crazy sections. So it's almost like the marriage of that old school, you know, prog, quirky prog with that heavier element, which makes up that whole album, really, I feel. Absolutely. Well, yeah, wh- whose idea was it to, or where did the where did the Muppet versions of the band come from? 
So you, that was uh, Charlie's idea. He was a bit of course old. it was Charlie's idea. Yeah, he's a creative wizard, and he loves doing stuff like that. And we, I think from what I remember, we weren't all around. So I went traveling at that point. I went to China, I think, so somewhere. Mm. And then I wasn't in the country, and Connor, actually Connor wasn't even in the band at that point. So, but the point was that we weren't all there together. So Charlie came up with the idea of maybe making Muppets of us instead which is an ingenious idea. And then he kind of based that on the Bohemian Rhapsody. On Queen. Video. Yeah, so we've got all these different influences coming from all of these different areas. Um, and that video was, for a lot of people, the first thing they saw of us, because we just signed to a new label, Inside Out Records. Right. And this was one of the first songs, I believe, that we released from that album. And it really almost acted like a springboard for us and propelled us into this whole new arena of um, fans. And It I made like me want to was... listen more. Yeah, a lot of people see that, and it's just a weird combination of things. <laughs> the quirky music, then you've got Muppets, and you've got yeah. Queen. I, I think, be... and uh, a, a really uh, great uh, song on like a, of social commentary. True, at the heart yeah. of it. Well, funny enough, that's one of the songs I wrote the lyrics for. Um, I don't always write lyrics, but this is one of the ones I chose to write. Mm. And I um, was a big fan of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson wrote the book for that. And I also loved the film as well. Yeah. It's essentially almost like an anti-capitalist theme running through it. And the idea that greed essentially will rot you in the end. Yeah, the, these stories of people mm -hmm. that work their way up the financial ladder, and then they crumble like Great Gatsby. Right, because they're people. hollow inside, right? Exactly, yeah. There's no integrity, yeah. Perfect. So, so I based the lyrics on that, and there's lots of metaphors in there, um, but it's all delivered in that tongue-in-cheek fashion, which um, we, we love to do. It was enough for me to get me going, for sure. Uh, and and I, I've enjoyed uh, getting to, uh, to, to know more of the band's music. I read that for... Um, uh, the first album, uh, Aquarius, uh, that you did a lot of the writing of that uh, on your own, and that in the subsequent years, the band now is sort of songwriting as as uh, a group, as a cohesive ensemble. Uh, what uh, is that like for y'all? <clears throat> uh, you know, where do uh, uh, the riffs come from, and uh, do the words come first, do the music come first, and like ideas of we need to make this in seven so that they know we're a prog band or that they, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, in terms of the writing, we've evolved a lot over the years. When it first started out, you know, I, I was doing a lot of the writing and it kind of evolved to the point where around the affinity time, we decided to start working together fully and collaborating ideas entirely. And that's something we've been honing over the last four, like eight years mm. or so, I guess around about that time. Um, but yeah, so now I feel like we fully realized that and that we, we understand how each other work and what our tastes are, which really helps with the whole process. Um, but in terms of making songs in seven mm. or 11, <laughs> it's not something we're really conscious of usually. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of the time we'll think, this sounds cool to me, like this groove, I like the way it feels. And maybe let's try and work out a song based around this theme or this idea. And then later on, we'll, we'll go back and we'll try and transcribe it and realize that actually I had no clue that it was in 11 the whole time. <laughs> and then someone else might think, actually, I'm not feeling it in 11. I'm feeling the pulse differently. Hmm. Maybe it's in 15 or something. So it's not really a thing that we're conscious of during the process of writing. That's it's fascinating. More, yeah, it's more about the feel and it's how... Relevant. Yeah, the, the rhythm feels to you or, and also it doesn't necessarily need to be a rhythm that's the, the, the starting point. It's True. essentially got to be, it's got to be like a, a theme or an idea, just an idea that's strong enough that can carry the song. It could be a melody or it could be just a key or a scale that you really like the sound of. That True. Could be like, it's almost like this color that you use and the yeah. song, if the song uses this one key or one scale the whole song has this thread that ties all the other ideas together um so yeah so that 
part of the process or the main part of the process i would say is finding that core key idea that is strong enough to carry the song right that's strong enough to then spawn these yeah. other ideas that surround it that creates a cohesive piece but I, I, it's totally important and i feel sometimes it is a rhythm and funny you mentioned seven seven eight we um uh, a song called in memoriam is a good example of this i feel anyway um so that one is in seven mm. but that rhythm it's like dun 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 it's just constantly through the song yeah 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 there's lots of different iterations of it but it's always there through the song so a lot of the time we're just basically playing with one idea but you know applying it in different contexts and that really helps give a sense of continuity to the music it's one of the things that really came through when I got the opportunity to see y'all live last year uh, outside Philadelphia. I was able to get close enough, uh, you know, to see Charlie doing his thing and, and, and Ross and you in the back. And, and like like you said, all of the uh, the players have a specific uh, role to play in in your pieces, and uh, you, I don't think they would be the same without any of you. And but it just it it. Nobody is like stepping on anybody else's territory, it seems like, and it works really, really well. So congratulations for the really fascinating uh, <laughs> sounds that you've been coming up with. And speaking of new sounds, <clears throat> you got a, a new album, Fauna, is coming out, I believe, on March 3rd. And on your website, it is billed as the band's most genre-busting and conceptually fascinating album to date. Do tell. Do tell. That's so what do we good. have? What do we have? That's a very bold statement. And a lot of the time we throw around the phrase, the most eclectic album to date. We say that a lot. And But I, I really do genuinely believe that this is the most diverse album that we've written. Um, we mm. really didn't have much of a filter during the process. And we, we just said, look, everyone can throw their ideas at the table. They can be as wacky or zany or wild as you want it doesn't matter sure. just throw your ideas into the pot and then we'll see if we can you know do something with it and that's what we did and we didn't really hold back with that whole process i do feel like it's resulted in the most varied and exhilarating music that we've ever come up with but we did have to spend a lot of time and probably more time than other albums really just gluing these ideas and making sure that it is cohesive at the same time we don't sure. want we don't want just a collection of ideas. We want to make sure it all flows and feels like a whole piece of music whilst also sounding like standalone songs. Right. Which is always part of the challenge. Um, but it was a it was a really fun process. And it was also the first album that we'd written with our new keyboard player, Pete Jones. And mm. yeah, and he he's a great guy. He's a great player. He actually was on the demos from way back in 2007. 2008 so it's been a while wonderful he's um, developed a lot as a player over that time to the music very fun um when did y'all figure out the uh the animal kingdom attachment to this so as i read Every song has a corresponding member of the animal kingdom. Uh, how so? How did that come to be? Uh, and how did the songs that feature animals uh, intersect with uh, the human condition on your on your album? Yes, yeah, so I feel like it was fairly early on that we had the title fauna, but we didn't really delve any deeper into the concepts. We just knew that it would be based around the animal kingdom. And we just like the the idea that the animal kingdom is such a vast and majestic thing. And it just gave us a lot of scope when we were writing the music. So that was always there in the background. And then as we were writing the music, maybe halfway, and we took the idea of taking animals or species and, you know, like studying them in a way mm. and looking how we could use them as metaphors for things that were going on in the human world and also personal experiences that we've been through. And we, we each had a go, as most of us had a, had a go at writing lyrics on this album, which really kind of broadened 
the subject matter that we were dealing with when it came to writing the lyrics but it was a, a very fun process and i feel like the that kind of varied nature of the animal kingdom reflects the music pretty well because as i said before it's our most eclectic album to date there you go <laughs> well well since yeah. we have animals incorporated you know on the tracks will we get to see a reincarnated mer uh, reincarnated mermaid uh I mean, on, on on the album I've been trying to make that happen for years and it's, uh, it's not happening yet. But, <laughs> I mean, that would be cool. That would be cool. That would be uh, an interesting one for tour. We'd have to really kind of get the animatronics going and that could be a lot of fun. That could be. Uh, the artwork also looks really awesome for this. Uh, how intertwined has the visual art for the album been with the development of the music? Well, firstly, we were working with a guy called Dan Goldsworthy who did the artwork for Charlie's solo album last year. Mm. And we were just blown away by how cool it looked. And Charlie said that this guy is incredible. He's very dedicated. And he's a big fan of Haken as well. Mm. So we were like, okay, cool. Let's, um, let's work with you. So much like love and passion into the music. And I think the fact that he was a fan of our music really helped you know he understood where we were coming from sure and he reflected what we were doing it almost feels like a continuation of the music in a way because it's very colorful it's very eclectic hmm. and it's uh it's intricate as well there's lots of little details in the artwork that people you know will probably pick up on they're like references from all of our previous albums but also references from the uh, the actual album itself. Awesome. So yeah, he he nailed it, and it's uh, awesome. seemed fun working with him. Good. So your your big headlining tour is coming up. First, you're heading across Europe, and I believe that starts on February 21st in Germany, and then y'all are coming to the United States in in May. So. I, I've never, uh, like, I, I've been on, like, choir tours and music tours, you know, like, on a bus for a couple weeks. But what's it like to be, like, gone from home for months at a time? Like, the best part and worst part of being on the road? I mean, I love going out and playing to people and meeting the fans because, essentially, we wouldn't be where we are sure. without people coming to see us play. And these are the people that bought our records and really kept us afloat and helped us you know, do what we do. So I love that side of it. And being in a bus with some of my best friends mm. for like a month is also great fun. We get to drink lots of coffee and tea and uh, watch movies together. So that side of it is very cool as well. But the, the flip side is that now I have a family. Ross has a family. As yeah. well, uh, kids And Charlie has a kid as well. That, um, when I first started taking, it wasn't a thing. So it was. it's a very different world now for me. Um, I do find that very hard. I mean, yeah. on this upcoming tour in um, March, both of my children have birthdays, so I'm going to miss those. And that's going to be sad. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's always that going on. But, you know, you've got to kind of balance it out. You know, when I come home from tour, I don't have a conventional working out job. So I can go and do the things I've missed out on. I can take my children to school. For I sure. can take them to the beavers and scouts or whatever they're doing. So, yeah, it kind of balances out. Mm. Um, and hopefully I can inspire my children through what I do. They could, they might grow up thinking, like, uh, I'm someone who's followed my dreams and I'd, I'd love for them to do the same. So, that's, you know, that these are the kind of thoughts that are going through my head in, yeah. in a way for me to justify being away. Do you have a, a personal favorite song that the band does on stage? I mean, we I, I loved Cockroach King. Hmm. But we we probably played it four million times. More than anything, yeah. <laughs> we could, we played it at every show since we released the album. It became like our anthem, which is really weird because it's one of the quirkiest, odd songs that we've written. Um, so that was, it's always good fun playing it though. I do love it. Uh, I, I feel like Crystallized, even though it's stupidly long, it's like 20 minutes long. Yeah. That one is... I don't know what it is about it, but it's very satisfying playing it. All the parts just fall under the fingers nicely. And it just sounds big. You know, sometimes you have a song that sounds huge when you, mm. you you mix it or you've just recorded it. You take it to the stage, it doesn't always translate so well. But with Crystallized, it just 
feels big and you can look out, you can tell people are enjoying the music. So that one's always a real pleasure to play. That was fun. Uh, you know, the the latest album from y'all that I have personally heard is Affinity. And I think Bound by Gravity is my new favorite song of yours. So oh, I, hope, yeah. I hope that's in the set list. But speaking well, of that, I what mean, is the set list going to look like this year? Well, unfortunately, no Bound by Gravity. <laughs> As far as I'm aware, because I mean, it's still fairly early on to be deciding on a set list for America. Sure. But it's tricky because when you're devising a set list, you want to make sure it's exciting. There's a lot, a lot of fast paced, heavy stuff, but then also you need to balance it out with a few kind of softer moments. Right. So it's, uh, it's a tricky business getting that balancing out right. We did actually try and play Bow by Gravity on the last tour we had before COVID. We were on tour with Devin Townsend and we had four other shows that we did on our own in between mm. shows with Devin. And the plan was to play Bound by Gravity. I know we played the Affinity album in full at these four shows, but we only managed to play two of those shows because COVID struck. Right. And the tour got cancelled. We come home. Yeah. So we, um, you luckily, you got to see one of the earlier shows. Oh, no, mm -hmm. sorry, this is that Symphony X tour that you came to. Yeah, I can, yeah, I saw y'all opening for, and playing so with Symphony X. Hmm. Yeah, but this was the Devon tour. So we only got to play Bound by Gravity twice. And that's the only two times we've played it. So you never know. You never we'll know. See. Maybe we'll bring it back to the stage. I'll, I'll let you know which show I'm coming to later on uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Speaking of, of seeing y'all, I noticed when I saw y'all last year, your interesting guitar. Uh, it looks like the uh, neck has been chopped off. So what led you to develop uh, this instrument and, and where is it available? Talk to me about your, your guitar. Well, I've been working with this company for it's nine years now. And they're a company called Strandberg and they're based in Sweden. Mm. I remember I got my first guitar by then. They sent me a guitar like a day before we flew out to play on Frog Nation 2014, uh, which was hosted by Mike Portnoy, which cool. is essentially a festival on a boat. And I'd never played an eight string at that point. I'd only been playing seven strings. So I, I thought for some reason it'd be a good idea to take this guitar and just play a show with it after never playing an eight string. And there were plenty of mistakes. So I'd hit <laughs> big, low B open B chords and end up hitting all the wrong strings ha. so I wouldn't advise that but um yeah I'm very lucky that I've been working with them for all of this time and last year early in the year I think it was January time we released my first signature guitar and I've been playing it ever since and it's it's an eight string guitar and it covers basically all of the the music that we need to play in Haken sure um I love it and that's a that's a guitar I brought out to, on the Symphony X tour. That's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you go to eight strings, what happens with the range? Does it get higher and lower, or just lower? It's lower. So we have it's like a standard six string guitar. Then we have a, a low B and then a low F sharp as well. Okay. Which sometimes we'll detune to a, a low E, and it's just cool because it gives you that extra range to almost treat the guitar like a like a pianist would. You know, right. sometimes you want to go to those lower regions when you're writing music just to get that darker texture or tone. So it's good to have that there at our disposal. But we don't overuse those low strings, to be honest. Mm. Uh, so another thing that I saw uh, from your uh, Instagram, from the band, is that y'all have been teasing something special for Valentine's Day. And so that's next month or next month, next week. Yeah. Uh, so what is coming up? uh for uh, all the star cross lovers out there is it a romantic song from haken <laughs> well it's a song from fauna called um love bite so it kind of you know fits the valentine vibe pretty well so the animal is the venus flytrap it's it's the uh black widow the black Spider. widow yeah it's, guessed wrong it's a pretty savage ritual that they go through during the mating process so the, the female Black Widow eats the male during this process, which is quite a gory idea. I mean, the, but if you listen to the tone of the music, it's almost tongue in cheek, hmm. very, very light natured, 
um, it feels to me like a mixture of Toto and Devin Townsend. It cool. had that playful nature to it. But um, we thought it would be cool to contrast this with like the most gory, death metal-esque lyrics that we've ever written. And it's very, very reminiscent of the likes of Cannibal Corpse, for example. <laughs> So the imagery, <laughs> the imagery behind these lyrics is very gory and dark. So that juxtaposition between these two moods is, um, you know, quite quite humorous and. Mm. Y'all are always coming up with the the most interesting points of view for your tunes. Um, <laughs> um, another thing that I saw on your Instagram, I have no idea how you're going to do this. You're offering one on one guitar lessons in coffee shops while you're on tour did i get that right you did yeah because i love coffee and i love guitar and i love hanging out so um it's something we've done in the past we um we will offer guitar lessons because we a lot of the time we're just hanging around on the bus so we play the show uh well like 10 o'clock at night sometimes nine o'clock yeah. at night we'll do a sound check earlier in the day but then there's a whole bunch of hours before that we need to use somehow because otherwise we're just twiddling our thumbs so it's good to just hang out with people and play through licks and talk about music and talk That's about great. guitar so it's good fun and gonna be so how do the they week. how do they how do people sign up for that just, just send me a message instagram. yeah you could send me you can send me a message on instagram or an email and uh we'll hook it up but um you need to like coffee or tea that helps very good very good. So uh, an, another thing that I read is that you uh, are an avid runner. So I was trying to figure out, like, how do you keep yourself in shape mentally and physically while you're on tour? And and uh, even you've done some marathons. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I, last year, I decided to run a marathon. It's something that's always been on my bucket list. Now, I've always wanted to do it. And I thought during COVID, I've actually got enough time to really dedicate to, to, to training for it. So I did it and um, my, cause my son has Down syndrome mm. and I, um, I wanted to dedicate it to one of the charities that helped me and my family. Um, so that's what I did. And it was uh, such a great experience running the marathon and also the training process and completing it at the end was very exhilarating, very happy to have done it. I'm gonna be doing another one this year, actually, just to keep up, you know, that healthy mindset. Yeah. Um, and it's fun actually, because that's another thing that you can do on tour to make, make use of that extra time that you have. So on the Symphony X tour, I was, I was jogging every day Awesome. and, and uh, just keeping busy, keeping fit that way. Do you have a, a favorite, uh, part of the, the country or world to tour? Like one of my, um, uh, patrons who lives in Brazil has inquired about this. He's like, like, when are y'all going to come to South America? I know that that's easier said than done, but like, are there plans beyond uh, touring uh, in Europe and America? Well, the two big markets are Europe and then America. And we're, we're always trying to expand the territories that we play in. A lot of, well, before COVID, a few years before COVID, we went over to Australia and mm. we played there for the first time. And then we did, I feel like New Zealand, we played a show there. Um, but we have been to South America. So we've done we've done one tour there. And to be honest, it was some of the best shows that we've ever played. I mean, like the, the show in Chile was one of the biggest crowds that we've ever played to. And it just blew us away because we'd never really been building the market over there. It just turns out that they're into that kind of music. So it's amazing. I've I've <clears throat> a lot of the videos of, of live performances of of metal and prog metal bands, especially within their South America. I'm like, where do all of those people come from? It's yeah. amazing the 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 crowds that it looks like uh, uh, come out down there. Really great. Um well I th I think that's all I, the the questions that I had for you today. You 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 just just put them right out there. So where do people come if they want to find out more about the band? Uh, uh, like uh, tour tickets, uh, merch, all that stuff. Well, you can go to our website haken dot com. It's hakenmusic dot com. Hey, yeah, I knew that was wrong. As I was saying I... it, like that doesn't feel right. <laughs> that doesn't... <laughs> that doesn't feel right. That's too good to be true. Fine. So it's hakenmusic.com. Awesome. Um, but generally, the best place to keep up with what we're doing is probably Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, mm. because there we get the you know the, the local updates. Especially on tour, we'll be posting a lot of things as we're doing them. 
Um, and you never know, you could see some videos of us practicing on Instagram as well, which might I be have good. been seeing that. I have been seeing that. Well, like, you know, was a uh, Nightingale that came out last year that y'all played on tour with Symphony X. That's part of the new album. Is that right? It is. That okay. one was released way ahead of yeah. the album. We, we thought it would be a cool idea to release a song just to introduce Pete to the band and let the fans know that we're still going, you know, we're still a band and sure. we, ha we have a new guy with us. Um, so that was a way to kind of introduce him to those guys. Um, and I think a lot of people thought that that was the beginning of the marketing for the album. And then they thought, okay, they've got a new album coming out next month. But it turned out, no, a year later. A year later. So yeah, so we've been sitting on that for a while and mm. It was good fun taking that to the stage because it's a tricky song, to be honest. There's lots of polyrhythms going on in there and quite intricate moments, which was quite hard to glue together on the mm. stage. But it was a lot of fun. And I'm hoping we can carry that on with the former stuff when we take that to the stage. It's going to be great. I, for one, am looking forward to, I'm not sure which uh, tour stop I'm going to hit. I, I, it might be New York. It might be Philly. It might be D.C., I don't know. I might travel to, I don't know. I might just, uh, you know, get a U-Haul and just t tag along at the back of the bus with y'all for, for, for a minute. But I definitely plan on, on seeing uh, the band when you're back in America uh, later this year. And I thank you for being with me. It's going to be wonderful to see y'all again. And really uh, good luck with the new album and the tour. And I, uh, I'll be uh, watching with, with great interest. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun. And if you do come to a show, come over. We'll have a drink. Make it make it New York, because that, that show is always a banger. It's always a good show. Um, but we'll share a drink together, and, yeah, we'll have some fun. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll meet up in New York, and uh, I'll show you the sites if you haven't seen them already. Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds great, Rich. Thank you for taking the time, and, and we'll see you along the way, all right? Thanks a lot. See you later. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.